Good morning, YouTubers. It's your buddy Chop It On coming at you with another episode of Chop Talk brought to you by the one, the only, DFSArmy.com. Your one-stop shop for all things DFS, MMA to PGA. We've got it all covered. All major sports. We also have a sister site launched last month. has been very successful called Beat the Bookie. Separate Slack, separate coaching, data-driven analysis. As you can see in the description, it's not Uncle Vinny telling you this is my fire pick or my guaranteed lock. We have a model that is being proven to win the sports betting game. 4-0 last night, the track record, you can talk to the guys over there on that site. But what I'm telling you is you want to click the link, you want to go over there and visit that site too. Because if you're into sports betting, we have assembled another great team, another great product to help you make money jump over there i'll put the link into probably the description uh, down below the comment section to both dfsarmy.com and maybe beat the bookie provide you with the coupon code chop chop to knock 10 percent off the dfs army subscription you can subscribe to one you can subscribe to the other you can subscribe to both it doesn't matter the beautiful thing is what we're doing is we're assembling coaching to help you become a better player that's what DFS Army is founded upon. That's what we're all about. What we're going to do today is dive into the research station for baseball. I'm going to break down that slate. I might look at some of the smaller slates. Then we're going to dive in to do the tight end section of the NFL research station at the very end. So stay tuned for that part. If you haven't been catching the other series, the quarterback, wide receiver, running back type, what we're doing is we're finding a way to break down the hyper simple approach showing a little bit of the research station how the filtering process pulls the best plays to the top which is a lot of what we do in baseball we're just transferring it over to nfl if you follow me thank you hit the like hit the subscribe button down there in the comment section as well and let's move in to baseball today as always i sort by starting pitching k percentage and i'm bringing the high strikeout pitches to the top i missed marquez last night i am sorry he was chalk that one is completely on me. I don't know why his season-long numbers didn't pop to the top. I'm guessing it was season-long, early season stuff, holding that stuff down. It didn't show me K-score. I flat missed it. That is my bad. And it's going to happen from time to time. If Rich Hill or Jay Happ have decent games, we're competitive. It doesn't much matter in cash games and league play, stuff like that. But, man, being that they didn't have great nights, Marquez owners at 61% in cash absolutely demolished me, probably demolished you. I'll fall on the sword. I'll be the leader of the cavalry. We come back at it again tomorrow. Now, well, tomorrow is today. And what we're looking at is the high strikeout pitchers, Kluber, Severino, Pavetta, Granky, Glass now, maybe. I like the fact that he's only $6,000. He's priced up on DraftKings. I like that quite a bit. Quintana, Ryu, Sanchez, Wheeler. Wheeler is a lot of people's chalk today. Uh, being that uh, Cutchins and McCutcheon's not with uh, San Francisco at the moment. So there you have it, and there you are. There's a lot of things to pick on and to talk about. So when we dive in and we're looking at Kluber, Severino, Pavetta types, we're looking at the odds in Vegas. And what we're going to do is scan that one over. I'm going to actually have to do some writing here because I looked. I skipped ahead to my pitchers before I finished up with – or my hitters before I pitched up uh, – <laughs> before I picked up on my pitchers. Man, are we tongue-tied early this morning. Minus 200 line for Kluber, 295 for Severino. These are pick with Pavetta, uh, Glasnow, whatever. Glasnow, I guess, is actually a plus 200. Why we have Kluber's numbers but not Pavetta's, I don't know. But plus 125, plus 123 for Quintana, minus 130. So we're not really focused a lot on these. Eovaldi to 185 is a solid number. I don't know if I need Mr. Framber get Valdez down here at a minus 225. That's clearly on the team, not on the pitcher. But it does give us some security when we take a look up here at Kluber and Severino as far as getting the win. What we're going to do, though, is look at the prices because we know they're going to be pricey. Look at them. They're basically flip-flop. 11 here, 10 here, 10 here, 11 here. That's kind of interesting. Looks like DK has a little bit more faith in Severino than Kluber. We might take that into consideration. Given that we've got the minus 200 favorites on both, let's look at the K score. Adding K percentage to op K here, and we've got, what is that, 51, 520? Is that right? Woo. 520 there. We've got a 508 uh, here. See what I'm doing? Just adding them together. 460, 472 out of what looks like Pavetta. Grinky has, well, 26 on his own. 22 is 485. 
So we're trying to look for numbers over 500. If you have never heard me do this before, I take the two percentages, add them together, and then drop the decimal pl place. So that 485 is a 48.5. Boom, drop out the decimal point, and now you've got 485. Low glass now, low team facing strikeouts. Cleveland doesn't strike out, but it's a 443 anyway. 443, you know what? For $6,000, I might be tempted. I, I mean, I probably will be tempted to have a lineup or two of glass now just because i don't need him to do a lot takes the pressure off of what i need out of him and i can load up on some bats there are some very expensive bats in good spots as you will see 460 471 for cantana wheeler 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 where you go 450 460 i'd like to see higher than that for a ten thousand dollar pitcher personally Evaldi doesn't mean i don't like him though Eovaldi facing high strikeout team in the White Sox. White Sox have been a little hot lately. That's not exactly a lock. 468. So if I'm looking at the high strikeout guys, they're up here at the top, of course. The 520 and the 508. And then we got a 472, 45, 471. A lot of 470, 480 range. If I don't want to pay the 10,000, 11,000. So Grinky would probably be out. He's an underdog. And he's a 485. If I was going to pay 10-2, I'd probably pay up for Severino at 10-6. Although Severino hadn't exactly been great lately either. Uh, Wheeler at a 460. And that one's either a pick em or a no line. Don't know how I feel about Zach Wheeler other than the fact that I don't worry about San Francisco getting me. I don't worry about them biting me in the butt. Uh, if I was going to pay... Yeah... I may go up to Kluber. I may, golly, this one's tough. You're getting my thought process. You're getting the him and hawing that I do myself before I make my article and before I make my picks. I settle in on these. But because I'd skipped the step earlier, that's why you're getting a little bit of this. We may dive over here, and it's going to slow us down, and I apologize. But hopefully you're learning a little bit from it. 98, 96, 61 for Pavetta. See, now I'm using this as a little bit of a tiebreaker. 93 for Granky, 92.9, whatever. I'll round up the point nines. I don't really round up the point eights. Glass not a 27. Yuck, yuck, yuck. Woo! That one, golly, I guess we kind of got to take the old glass now off of there because that's, that's filthy. Filthy low. Ryu Sanchez, Wheeler, 93.9, call it a 94. Where do Evaldi go? He's the only one I've really got left. I don't ever look at absolutely everybody on the slate. I don't see the point. I'm sticking with the high K scores, and then some of the DFSA grade Vegas odds stuff helps me take tiebreakers, but I'm really focused on K score because I believe strikeouts matter. Strikeouts are essential to good pitching performances. They also provide your, your low. Strikeout potential is generally strikeout potential. If I'm just a contact guy, balls find holes, things happen, my defense kicks the ball. But if I if I get you to swing and miss, then I kind of control my own destiny, and I can become a more consistent pitcher. I've also got more upside because every time I strike somebody out, I'm getting three extra points. It erases earned runs allowed. It erases a little bit of damage that I might give up along the way so I can have an early rough start and repair the damage and come out with 8, 9, 10 Ks. And that's, you know, 30 to 40 points right there alone. So that does definitely help. And that's why I focus on that so much. I use Vegas to give me a little extra confidence. I use DFSA grade to give me a little extra confidence. And then I'm trying to use the prices to determine who's giving me the best strikeout potential on the night, also with a chance at the win, also with a high DFSA grade, etc. So... Again, when I start with Kluber and Severino up top, I may or may not do the Kluber bit. Tampa Bay isn't exactly a slouch. They, they do score some runs. I, I don't really know. I'd have to probably game log hunt that one. Severino, minus 295 is nice. 508 K score is nice. 96 DFSA rating is nice. Detroit isn't an offense that scares me outside of last night. I mean, what the hell? Everybody, you know, blind squirrels find nuts. That's just the way that it works, especially when they reach into their jock straps. Hey oh, but... Anyway, sorry, cheesy joke warning. It's a Friday. I'm in a good mood. Pavetta, low K score, 570 or 472. Isn't exactly low. It's a lower DFSA grade. It's a pick em. I don't like to pick em. I don't mind the 8K. I don't necessarily like attacking Chicago. So that one's kind of a wash. We'll have to see if something in that 8K range doesn't. Uh, I'm not interested in Pavetta. I would be doing it to save $2,000.
But I'm not all that high on Severino, not all that high on Grinky. Wheeler's okay, 94 pick em game, 460 K score. Not excited there either, the more I look at it. So all my 10K guys are not exciting. Kluber might be the better one. Any of these guys can have great nights, though. I look at Quintana at 7,700, pick em game, 471. It's the same as Pavetta, so I'd game log hunt that one. Pavetta's got a 60 DFSA grade. Pavetta, or Quintana's got a 73. Quintana's taken on Philly. Pavetta's taken on Chicago. Obviously, it's a flip-flop situation. That tells me I might want to be off the bats because if we're dealing with decent pitchers that we're considering for our own DFS rosters, we're not really interested in the bats in those games, especially when we have another 13, 14 games to look at. So nothing so far. Eovaldi priced up 7,400. We'll see how he compares. A 468K score isn't that much different than the 471. 79 DFSA grade is higher. Minus 185 is a lot more. See, I would probably go Eovaldi. We're picking on the Chicago White Sox, which, again, they've been scoring runs lately. That's not exactly the safest thing in the world, but it's got the tiebreakers for us. It's got Vegas support to minus 185. The K score is about the same in the 470 range. The price is about the same in the mid-7s. The 185 Vegas helps, and the 79 case or DFSA grade helps. And then I look at the offense, and or the, look at the team they're facing in the Chicago White Sox and their offense, and I see that it's not necessarily some juggernaut that I'm afraid of. So in the mid sevens, that lower price tier, I probably look at Eovaldi. Glass now plus 200 underdog, 440k score, 27 DFSA grade. I can cross him right off. I was excited to maybe use him and certainly throw him in some GPPs. But if you're playing something that you can win with a little bit less risk, don't take that kind of risk because you're seeing a 27 DFSA grade, a low K score, and an underdog situation, a strong underdog situation. There's That's telling you there's risk there. That's telling you it's not a sure thing to get you great points. He could have a great night, but there's a lot of indicators pointing that he might not or that he probably shouldn't have a great night. You know, say um, six, seven times out of ten, he faces this team. He's probably not going to do super well. Now, there are times when he once or twice he might have the game of his life, and that would be fine. Hopefully you catch that if you're in a GPP tonight. But I'm trying to take the, a lot of the risk out of the pitching because pitching, again, is points we can kind of control, points we can kind of bank on, like a quarterback in NFL, which we'll speed up and get to that here in a second. But as I look through this list, um, Kluber probably is the top option, Severino, um Wheeler, I guess, or maybe okay. I might lean Severino. I would game log hunt it for sure because Severino hasn't been all that sharp lately, and I know that. Pavetta, probably not, because if I was going to save the money and go down to 8000 with Pavetta, I'd probably drop further and look at Quintana or certainly Eovaldi, and I'd probably choose Eovaldi. So if I'm running leagues and I'm running five lineups out in a 100-man league or smaller GPP-type situations, I don't need that Kluber pitcher. I don't need that high, high, high floor because in an upside type competition where I'm looking for, I need to be in the top two of 10 people or I need to be in the top 12 of 100 people or something like that, then what I'm really looking for is something that's going to get me up there. And in a lot of cases, being able to target those big bats in good spots is what's going to do that on nights they come through rather than get me 50 points out of my pitcher and then a bunch of three sixes and nines out of my my punt bats that's great for cash games it's not so great for gpps and upside contests like 100 man leagues it still wins on occasion just like anything else like we say run it 100 times you're going to have a few good ones and a few bad ones and a whole bunch of where it should land but the philosophy is I can buy up some of those bats stack those bigger offenses in great spots together correlate a little bit better and that's what's going to help boost me over the top. So I try to get into the bigger offenses, the Yankees, the Bostons, the Clevelands, whatever. And I'm trying to get into the meats of their order because these are the guys that are the MVPs. These are the guys that are winning the silver bats. These are the guys that are on the league leaders, which means odds are they are going to perform and have the big nights. Not your little, you know, Jose Iglesias in Detroit bat in the eight hole. I'd rather have J.D. Martinez in the three hole in Boston. Duh, right? Of course, I have to pay for that. When I have to pay for that, I have to sacrifice on the pitching. Hitting's more fluky than pitching. I'm rambling. Let's move on. What we're looking at for tonight when we go to the five-star type situation and bang up on those bats is we sort by ascending, descending, whatever. 
whatever it wants to do for us. And then we'll come down here to the bottom since this is, and we're looking for anything below Chassin. So I come back over here and I'm looking for uh, Washington, St. Louis, New York, Kansas City, Cleveland, Minnesota, LA, Texas, Colorado. Looking for these bats. Those get the first star. Second star is high implied run totals. You see where I get that. I scroll over to the Vegas section over here. Sort by opponent's runs. Anything over about a 4.9 tonight, 4.7, 4.8, whatever, is what came up. Mostly the fives and higher. New York, Yankees, Cleveland, Boston, Milwaukee, Houston, Astros. Slated by Vegas to score runs. Vegas sees them as good offenses in decent matchups. When I look at the double red, which is one of our favorite categories, I sort by Woba against. And again, for those of you that are new, I'm looking for what is the pitcher struggling with righties or lefties or preferably both. I don't pay too much attention to the right-hand side or the left-hand side unless I've got nothing looking at both. I'd rather just take the guy struggling with both and call it a day. And I do that by sorting by WOBA against. I come down here to where the pink starts turning white, and then I look for numbers like this that are pink on the other side too. Sanchez, Straley, Glass now, Byers, maybe Pavetta. Zimmerman, Hutchinson, Bailey, and of course Kennedy doesn't have very many batters faced, but Kennedy's there. So when I come over here and I start down here and work my way up again, that list is Miami is where we start of all places. Toronto, Cleveland, Seattle, New York Yankees, Minnesota, St. Louis, Colorado. Okay, those are three stars. Those are the, the factors I like a lot. Then I'll dig in a little bit more to Chin Music and look at the chart here with Who's scoring the runs over the last 30 days and who's giving up runs over the last 30 days and who are these teams facing, of course, because we want to target this pitching with opposing bats. And over here, of course, you see I stopped at about six or seven. So you see the Yankees, the Rangers, the Red Sox, the Nationals, the Cardinals, Mets, and the Indians. Want to throw these guys on there? Fine. Dodgers, White Sox, in play, no problem. Come over here and who do the Orioles match up against? Who the Blue Jays, Rangers, whatever match up? Went down to seven again. And you got Royals in a good spot, Twins in a good spot because they're matching up against these guys. Marlins in a good spot again, Orioles in a good spot, Astros, Athletics, Rockies. Okay, so now we add those five. We've got five parameters we're looking for, five boxes. We want to see check marks in as many boxes as we possibly can because it's an indicator, logically, that the offense is in a good spot. And four-star offense, the Yankees. You heard their names mentioned on a lot of those lists. The Yankees are a four-star offense. Cleveland is a four-star offense. Those are expensive offenses. Now you can see why I might be more tempted to dip down into a glass now or an Evaldi or something like that. If I can get a Yankees and a Cleveland stack, the odds are with me. I'm going to get five, six, seven runs out of those offenses, both of them. And if I've got the right mixture of bats in there because I could afford it, I'm set to have a pretty good night. Is it like targeting the Detroit Tigers, when they go off for 10 runs and you got them by ownership all by yourself? No, but that's not what my philosophy is. That's not what I'm trying to do. What I'm trying to do is I'm trying to make sure that I'm stacking the deck in my favor so that I'm going to win more often because I need to win more often in cash and small leagues than I do in big GPPs because the reward is not as high for doing the winning. So I don't need to take those crazy long shots. That's just how I enjoy playing. That's how I enjoy coaching. It's fundamentally sound. It teaches people to stop chasing the big lottery ticket co uh, contests, get into the more fundamental stuff, build your bankroll up that way, and then take maybe 10% of your daily budget, a dollar, two dollars, five dollars, ten dollars, whatever about 10% of your daily budget is, and then chase the big stuff with that. So you're splitting it up. You know, you're 80, 90% in cash, 10 to 20% in GPPs, and now you're exposed to those cash. You're gr if you're If you're profitable in cash, whether it's, 10%, 20%, 30% ROI over the course of a 100-game season, now you're looking okay. You can grind that 100 bucks up to 150 bucks, But you're indefinitely sitting there waiting for that 10% to do damage on your really, really good nights. That's what spawned the ladder theory, which you can look for on, on our website. That's what spawned a lot of my contest selection stuff that I've talked with our VIPs about. It's basically just what I do. It's what I teach. It's just It just makes common sense to me and has eventually turned a lot of people's games around inside the Army. So that's why you need to be a VIP. Three-star offenses, St. Louis, Minnesota, Colorado. Two-star offenses, Washington, Kansas City, Texas, Boston, Miami, Houston. I'm not going to go through the bats 
in those two-star offenses, but I will walk through the four and the three-star offenses for you. I've already sorted by L7 Woba. Another way to look is on our starting lineups page, MLB tab, down here to starting lineups. Look for the X Wobas. That's what that's a should do number. That's what the batter should be doing. He hits a line drive 22 degrees at 100 and whatever 10 miles an hour. It should be a base hit. You know, 60% of the time it should be a double. 30% of the time it should be a triple. 10% of the time it should be a home run. 5% of the time, whatever the stat cast numbers do with launch angle, it's telling you basically what his woba should be based on the way he's hitting the ball. So if we see high X wobas and we see low actual wobas, we're looking for a positive regression candidate, somebody who's just getting unlucky and should normalize, should regress to his numbers. And those are targets a lot of guys use. I don't use them myself. Just It's another, another way to add players to a list. It works just great. I just happen to use L7 Woba. I, I condone both ways. I love guys to come into my room in Slack and talk about X Woba numbers because a lot of times it puts us on people that weren't on this list for whatever reason or in an offense we weren't targeting and they make great one-offs. That's how groupthink works. That's how we get we get better. We teach each other, honestly. That's why I say we've got experts and we've got novices and everybody alike and everybody learns. I learn from my guys all the time. I shouldn't call them my guys, but you know what I mean. The guys in my room, the guys that frequent my room that talk to me, I learn from those guys a lot too. They, I encourage it. I, I love it when we have these discussions because we all get better as a result. So I, I tip into the trends tab. I sort L7 Woba by 350 and higher. Let's dive into New York. New York Yankees, Andujar, Torres, Hicks, Romine, Voigt. And this doesn't mean these are the only guys you should be playing. This means that if you're stacking the Yankees, these guys should most definitely be included. You want to throw Stanton in there? Do it. You know, you, you want to run a Brett Gardner in there on BVP? Do it. I didn't look that up, but if you saw great BVP and you wanted to, go for it. That's how you win. Okay, you take my basics, my limited player pool, and expand on it with your own research, with your own numbers. And that's how you're going to get on guys I'm not on. You're going to get on different guys. We get different lineups, and the next thing you know, you succeed, and I had a crappy night. Happens all the time, trust me. But I'm going to usually be right there in the middle of the mix. I'm usually going to be in the top half of the contests that I enter. And on good nights, when I'm running good, I'm in the top 10 out of 100 people constantly. That's where I make my money, too. And that's how I'm showing you how to at least – Get the foundation put in place to do this for yourself. Kick over on to Cleveland. Encarnacion, Kipnis, Alonzo, Melky Cabrera, Jan Gomes. Once again, if you're going to stack Cleveland, these are the guys that should definitely be included. They don't have to comprise your whole stack. St. Louis. Carpenter, Martinez, O'Neal. There's a lot of room. You want to run a Yadier Molina? Do it. If you've got logic and you've got numbers backing your play, why you see it being beneficial, why you see it having upside tonight, why you see it being in a good matchup, run it. But surround a Yadier Molina with Carpenter, Martinez, or O'Neal because they're also hitting well. So I'm cutting a lot of your work down for you. Minnesota, it's no shock that Minnesota never has anybody on this list. And when they are, they don't stay on it for long. Minnesota's not a good offense. However, they're in a great spot tonight. If you run Minnesota bats, you should probably include Tyler Austin right now. He's got the higher Woba on the team over the last seven days. Now, he's coming down off his two-week numbers, so you might want to give a little bit of caution there. Let's double-check really quick. ISO's up way up there, 474 over the last week. That's great. Hard contact, 43. So it's staying the same. It's hard contact staying the same. This could just be normalizing because a 440 is not really sustainable, so maybe he's coming down to where he should be. Because his hard contact's not stopping. Make sense? That's how we look at these numbers. And we use these numbers. And you need the controls of this research station yourself to be able to do that. Because I'm only showing you limited information. Because we only have so much time in a day. And I've got a crap load of stuff I have to do. Colorado Rockies, Blackman, Cargo, Dahl, DJ LeMayhew, Tony Walters. Walters at 2100. If he gets the start, boy, that's, that's a good cheap option. Not like Brett Kennedy's anything special. No offense to the Kennedy family. Um, fours and five hundreds? Okay. 
I can handle that as a team. I could also run other guys in there with these guys, but these are going to be the foundation of what it is that I do. So that's your basics with the MLB stuff today. What I want to do now is I want to transition over real quick, and I want to talk a little bit about the tight ends because it's super fast. If you heard me talk about uh, quarterbacks, wide receivers, you know, and whatnot, sometimes we look for home teams, sometimes we look. What we're trying to do is we're trying to slant the odds in our favor and show you on the research station how you can quickly determine who's most likely to hit value for the week. Is it a guarantee? No. Does it stack the deck? Yes. That's the idea. Get as many deck stackers on your team as possible and run it in some cash lineups because the odds are it will perform okay. It won't be the nut lineup. It won't. But it's going to be good enough a lot of the time. And that's the whole point. So when we look at the tight ends, what are we looking for? What we find is that the players that hit value more often are players that get eight or more targets, just like receivers. They get red zone work. Duh, they're tight ends. They need to be getting red. If you don't use your tight end in the red zone, what the hell am I playing him for? Because that's where bulk of their points come from. I mean, we don't have a lot of them that are just little three-yard slant guys in the middle of the field, and then when we get down to the end zone, we just forget about him. That doesn't make sense. That's not the NFL I know. But we need red zone work. We need a high implied total. Why? Because we need, they're oftentimes the second and third option in an offense, and we need there to be three or four touchdowns scored in that game for the tight end to maybe get one. Yeah, in a 10-point you know, point game, sometimes the tight end's the guy that got the touchdown, but you're going to have better success if he scores three, four, five. I know, Captain Obvious, right? Master of the obvious. But I'm just pointing out the threshold is about 24 implied points. If teams score over 24 points, the tight ends have a better chance of having a good day than if they only scored 18 or 22, which you would normally think is still okay. There are thresholds, and that's what we're spotting. That's what we're noticing. Home team, and they need to be favored, because the home team, I don't know why, but the majority of the time the tight ends have better days at home. They need to be favored, obviously. If you're going to score 24 points or more, you're going to be favored an awful lot. So if we can cut this down, there are game flow reasons why, you know, a, a lot of these types of scenarios, if you stop and think about it, why the home, why the tight ends would perform a little bit better. But in a general sense, I mean, because if I'm behind, if I'm the underdog and I'm airing it out down the field 15, 20, 30 yards, I'm usually not targeting my tight end with that. I don't very often come out of the huddle and say, you know, hey, David Njoku, go long. I need my flamethrower to do that. I couldn't even tell you the tight end right now in Baltimore yet because I'm not that deep into my knowledge of the league and the way the teams have shuffled around. But I can tell you John Brown is in Baltimore, and if I'm coming out of the huddle saying, I'm going to be in the shotgun, I need somebody to get 60 yards down the field. Yo, tight end, I'm looking at you. Uh-uh. That ain't how that works. I'm looking at John Brown. I'm saying give the dude a little shake and bake about seven yards out and just fly. I'll hit you. I'm going to throw this thing to freaking Detroit, and you're going to run under it and catch it. My tight end's not the guy that – now, if I need my tight end, hey, smash that dude in the mouth, take a step to the left, and then run to the right. Do it just across the goal line about two – that's what I – so home teams that are favored – are generally going to be playing shorter ball control, third down conversion, not taking a lot of risk, and they're going to be choosing a little bit of those safer routes, a little bit of seam route, things like that with their tight ends. Whereas teams that are underdogs are pinning their ears back and just chucking it down the field, and the tight end kind of gets removed from that game. So it honestly makes a lot of sense as to why we're getting red zone work and home team in favor with high implied totals, and that's why we're slant slanting the odds in our favor with these tight ends that way. So how do we do it in the NFL? research station as you've been looking up and down here as I've been rambling on and on what you're going to do is in the yellow you're going to find the home teams in the projected points you're finding it for the actual tight end what we're calling and this ebbs and flows we're updating these daily at this point certainly next week we will be you look at the Vegas lines you look for the high implied totals let's sort out and go over and I'm going to do this video again for just the tight ends just over 24. That's all I want to look at. And I'm looking for, look, they're all favored. 
So that helped. If I sort it by descending order, let's put the higher team totals to the top. And let's see, Benjamin Watson, is that my Baltimore? No, tight end in New Orleans. See, I'm learning the league again every year just like you are. We'll get there in a couple of weeks, no problem. Don't expect me to be some, you know, tout on TV on ESPN that has a teleprompter telling them where all these people play. I will learn these as they come to me, as they become relevant to me. Benjamin Watson is somebody that I will probably remember going forward as a New Orleans uh, tight end because he's in a good spot this week. He's got the high implied total. He's got the big spread. He's at home. Let's see if these guys are averaging over eight targets per game. Total defense, total stats. Eight targets per game. Nothing for Watson, of course. Didn't play much last year, I suppose. Seven and a half for Gronk. Seven for, is that Doyle? There you go. Seven for Delaney Walker. We don't have anyone averaging over eight, but we've got a couple of them getting up there. Delaney Walker and Jack Doyle, are you the home team? Delaney Walker is not, so he would become more of a GPP gamble because the odds tell you the road tight ends don't make value. He's not getting eight targets. He's close, but he's not getting eight targets. We know he gets some red zone work, but his implied team total is just over the threshold of 24. So he's kind of on the fringe of what we would look at. Therefore, there's more risk. Therefore, he's more of a GPP play. Making sense? However, when I go after a Jack Doyle, which is interesting because, man, this whole Ebron thing, I hate tight end by committee. Hate it. But Jack Doyle was getting close to seven or eight uh, targets per game. Definitely getting red zone work. We'll show it in a minute. Favored over the team total at home. More odds stacked in his favor to have a good game. That's what we're looking for. Well, you know, Kyle Rudolph's another one in a good spot. If I scroll over and show Kyle Rudolph's targets, they're a little low at five. But he's favored high team total. These are guys that, you know, these are going to land on the short lists. And they're different price points. If you want to pay down, pay down. You want to pay up for Gronk, pay up for Gronk. Gronk's almost always in play, by the way. So, I mean, he's in a category by himself. Travis Kelsey's probably in play, too. He's obviously on the road or they're not favored or something. Otherwise, he'd be on this list that we're sorting through. But Gronk and Kelsey are pretty much always in play. Inside the 20, Gronk gets the ball. Kyle Rudolph gets the ball. Look at Jesse James targets. Down here, Ebron. Doyle gets him. It's a split, man. That'd be Gronk-esque if they only had one tight end they were using. That's a shame. And Delaney Walker gets, you know, gets fair share of targets as well. But remember, they've got big backs. Sometimes in Tennessee, they're gonna run, they were running in the ball a lot. Marcus Mariota's no slouch with his legs, or at least, you know, he's not a Cam Newton, but he runs in a few. These guys, that offsets a little bit of what you do, obviously. Looking inside the 10, though, 8, 7, 9, 8, 9. These are maybe guys you want to target for the touchdowns. So when we look at the red zone work, these guys are getting red zone work for the most part. You know, Vance McDonald, not so much. It was probably more of a role thing. Virgil Green, probably same bit. Oh, yeah, that was in Denver last year, wasn't it? Uh, he might bounce back because you can't go further down than that. But at any rate, that's the general idea. And if you want to sort by price, you can start grabbing pay down if a guy's in a similar spot. This is going to be the same thing we're looking at with pitchers, with K-score and everything else. If I'm looking at home team and I'm looking at implied run total or implied team total and I'm looking at the, the heavy favorites, targets, red zone work, and I check all of those boxes. And let's say I've got two guys with four out of five boxes checked. I might be taking the cheaper guy. Tight end's a more volatile position. So if I'm going to be paying for volatility, I might as well pay as little as possible for it. If I'm not going all the way up to Gronk because I sacrificed it running back or quarterback or something, or intentionally run a Brady Gronk stack or something like that, then what I need to be doing is I need to be probably paying down at the more volatile positions. So that would bring, you know, your Kyle Rudolph, your Jack Doyle, not so much Delaney Walker even. 
that would bring these guys into play. Making sense? Anyway, that's quickly done. That's the, God, we're 35 minutes. I apologize. But that is the tight ends in the NFL Research Station. That is your baseball slate broken down today. This type of coaching, this type of content, I wanted to show you a couple of other things that I might get to in other videos. I've got a visual on why the games are getting tougher. I've got a visual on how your contests should be layered. I've got these things that I will show at some point in time when we don't have some of the content to cover. So if you want to talk about these things and you want to maybe banter back and forth, get some coaching, get some advice, get some fundamental advice to make yourself a little bit better player, stop the bleeding, stop the redepositing, you need to become a VIP. You do that by going down to the comments section, dfsarmy.com, coupon code CHOP, C-H-O-P. Also check the Beat the Bookie link that I'm going to put in there because that's another way to buoy bankroll. If you're 4-0, and o, you can take some of that money and use it in DFS. Everything works upon itself inside DFS Army. We're just here to provide the content to make you better at what it is you enjoy doing. Come inside, take a look at us. It's Friday. You probably got paid. You've got a little spare chingy ching in your wallet. Come on in. Let's talk. You can get in today before the slate locks, and I'll talk to you on the inside. Later, guys.